Welcome behind the scenes of the DEA Museum. I'm Casey, the museum's historian. And I'm Emma, the museum technician. And we're here in the collections facility to introduce this month's featured artifact, an opium pillow. Every month, we'll take you into the collection and share stories about our most exciting objects. This ceramic pillow transports us to a time when people visited opium dens around the world to smoke the drug. Opium is a narcotic that comes from poppy plants. It dulls the senses and relieves pain, but is also highly addictive. Opium use spiked in 18th century China when Britain and other Western countries traded the drug. At that time, opium was grown on plantations in India and exported by European traders who then sold the drug to people across China. Smoking opium became very popular there, and people of all social classes opened, operated, or visited businesses where they could use the drug. These opium dens stocked the drug and tools to use it, like pipes. Because opium is a depressant, people who smoke it feel drowsy and prefer a dark place to lie down or recline. Fabric pillows, blankets, and heavy curtains typically fill these comfortable spaces, but customers sometimes use ceramic or wooden pillows like this one to rest their heads. Chinese craftspeople first made ceramic pillows thousands of years ago. Beautifully decorated pillows date back to China's earliest dynasties and feature culturally significant symbols, poetry, and intricate designs. Many are hollow and have holes so people can store their personal or valuable items inside. In opium dens, customers would put their valuables inside the pillow, put the side with the opening against a wall, and lay their head against its surface. This posture secured their possessions inside as they used opium. The pillow's exterior was cool to the touch, and it felt refreshing in hot, humid climates. By the 19th century, opium addiction spread across China as more and more people used the drug. The Chinese government took action when upper-class citizens, leaders, and business owners struggled to perform their duties. Government officials seized and destroyed more than a ton of opium, angering European, especially British, traders. China's attempt to end the opium trade sparked two wars with Britain and other trading nations, the first in 1839 and the second in 1856. The Qing dynasty lost both conflicts and, as a result, lost control over the trade. As Britain and other European countries like France sold more opium around the world, addiction and opium dens spread. People also brought opium smoking to new places as they traveled. For example, Chinese immigrants came to California in the 1850s to work in gold mines, on railroads, and other growing industries. Some opened opium dens, especially in big cities like San Francisco. In the United States, smoking opium became widely associated with Chinese immigrants, gamblers, and prostitutes, even though people from all walks of life used the drug and visited opium dens. Communities that feared these groups demanded anti-smoking opium legislation. San Francisco became the first city to make operating or visiting an opium den illegal in 1875. These laws coincided with growing international efforts to slow the opium trade as addiction spread. China continued to advocate for ending the trade that affected its citizens, but was controlled by Europeans. In 1909, the International Opium Commission convened in Shanghai and recommended that nations regulate opium's manufacture, sale, and distribution, and respect the laws of those nations that prohibited its importation. In response to the commission, the United States passed the Smoking Opium Exclusion Act in 1909, the first federal ban on any drug. The law prohibited the importation of opium except for medical purposes. Since smoking opium was not used medicinally, the law almost totally banned the drug in the U.S. Opium dens closed and decorative ceramic pillows were used less and less. This opium pillow is only one of over 45,000 artifacts, documents, and videos in the DEA Museum's collection. Each illustrates an important moment in the history of DEA, federal drug law enforcement, and drug use in American culture. To learn more about DEA's work and other fascinating stories from the collection, follow the museum on Facebook, go to deamuseum.org, or visit the museum in person. Thanks for joining us.